Yeah, the Bulls are winning games, and it's been fun to watch them over the last 10 games. What do you think has been the biggest reason why we're seeing them have success? Uh, plain and simple, it's the pace that they're playing at. And it's uh, I'm glad you asked that question right out of the shoot there, Lawrence, because I was just going through the numbers. You know, if you go back and you look at this stretch and you look at the games that they've actually won, you can talk about, you know, 88 field goal attempts last night, 89 versus the Sixers, 93 versus the Heat, the one they won, you know, 102 versus the Spurs, 90 versus the Hornets, 88 versus the Pelicans. And then you go back and you look at some of the games that they've lost as of late. You know, the Heat game that they lost, 77 field goals attempted. The Nuggets, only 86. You're like, only 86? But it's just, there's such a fine line for this team right now. The more field goal attempts you can get up, the less percentage you have to shoot. And I think they've just found that if we can play this way, and that's the big question, sustainability, this is how we give ourselves the best chance to win. That's part of it. The other part has been smart, willing, controlled, aware defense. And I know we always want to talk about this. It's easy to look at the scoring and and see the shots splashing in. But I was noting to start the show, Will, they don't have that stupid, like, foul the three-point shooter thing that used to they, they make a habit of that they're not racing out hurriedly to get to shooters because they're late in their rotations. One step in the way the gears of that clock kind of turn can make all the difference. Yeah, but you know how that starts, right, Dan? Because I, let, let me just, I'm going to use myself as an example. I don't want to put words in anybody's mouths because I haven't directly asked guys, but I'm just telling you from experience, if I know, that I'm going to get touches on the offensive end of the floor. Not necessarily shots, but touches. I'm going to play harder on defense, and I'm going to cover your ass when you make a mistake because I know you'll make it up on the other end, regardless of who you want to point at. But when you know the ball is moving around and guys are making, as you said, smart decisions offensively, but at the same time defensively, but yet you're getting touches – the energy and the effort you put forth on the defensive end ramps up. And that's part of the equation is I as a big, Vooch as a big. Listen, I I can sit here and say, can Vooch's defense be better? Absolutely. But it's gotten better in this last 10-game stretch because he's getting touches offensively. I also think he's better positioned. I I just think he's. it it does look like, too, instead of trying to – post him up low that he's working his way out just a a little bit higher and he's going to have to hit some in-between jumpers and floaters but with all of that movement and we're using him as a fulcrum in in this much more free-flowing offense has has just gotten him he just looks comfortable yeah but he, he he makes good decisions and i've talked about this since he's been here You know, the interesting thing, if you go back and look at his numbers, some of his best games, and honestly, his best game last season was against Jokic in Denver, in Denver. And I keep asking myself, why aren't we playing more like the Nuggets play with the ball in Vooch's hands? Because I feel like he can make those good decisions. He can shoot the ball well enough that, well, it's going to pull his man out of the paint. He can do the dribble weave. He can knock down the three. And they've started to do that. And I think, as you just pointed out, that's had a lot to do with it. You know, the interesting thing is you said he's got to hit that mid-range little floater, right? Mm -hmm. Casey Johnson just had in uh, his article uh, last night after the game that in the past, in that five- to eight-foot range, Jokic with that little floater has been at 77%. I think that's the number. Right now, he's only hitting 66 because he got up to such a slow start. But he has improved dramatically over the last probably 10 or 12 games. And I haven't been to practice, but some of the video that guys have been shooting that have been at practice, what do you see? You see Vooch in the background practicing that shot after practice, getting in the extra work, and that extra work is starting to pay off. 
Well, with everything that's gone right for, for the Bulls, one of the things that I think is interesting is deployment of Andre Drummond. I think that Billy's figured out now how to use him. How is he using him? Well, it, part of it is is this how they play because now they're opening things up is his activity allows him to be so efficient on the offensive end of the floor. And when I say efficient, I don't mean his ability to, you know, score points. I mean to get offensive rebounds, to generate second-chance opportunities. He, much like Vooch now, is getting the ball on the move, as Dan just talked about with Vooch. You're not necessarily just dropping him in the post and says, hey, you got six inches on this guy, go to work. You know, Andre Drummond, as much success as he's had in his career, most notably with Detroit, it wasn't as a post-up guy, you know, pound the ball and then eventually just overpower your man and put it off the glass and score. His biggest attributes are his ability to run the floor, his ability now to, how about this, make free throws, shot three out of four last night against the Lakers, and just get the ball in better positions to score, most notably on the move when the defense is scrambling. When you mentioned Vooch's best game, the first one I thought of from last year was when the Bulls, January 15th, the Bulls were, they beat Golden State 132 to 118. Remember that one? They had the big 40 oh, yeah. point fourth quarter, Vooch, 43 points, 13 rebounds, and four assists. You remember what was notable about that, that game? Yes. Jamar didn't play. So <laughs> regardless, and, and I know that we're, we're piling on Zach right now and praising the way that Demar is adapting his game, but the the three cooks in the kitchen may just not work. It, it may just be these these three guys, with this, uh, the, some of them want to be in the same spots at the same times, and whatever it may be, this current iteration – it's just there, there's there's oxygen feeding the fire. Well, Dan, I'm glad you brought that up because I contest, and some people can argue all they want, that unfortunately for Zach, his injury couldn't have happened at a worse time because everybody's like, is there a correlation? Absolutely. Okay? But to me, the correlation is more about the number of shots that other people are now going to get more so than then just it's this is all about Zach. I continue to say if it was Vooch that was out and injured, or if it was DeMar that was out and injured, we would have some similar results because of it's one less isolation type basketball individual holding the basketball. I mean, like last night, you want to talk about efficiency. DeMar, 12 out of 16. Yep. I thought for sure when you were talking about that and I was going to look at this stat sheet that DeMar had 20, 24, 25 shots, but he had 16. Now, we're used to seeing DeMar isolate and DeMar go one-on-one and DeMar try to get the foul. And quite honestly, there's been some games in this stretch where we're doing the games at NBC Sports Chicago and we're yelling at the screen, DeMar, pass the ball because he kind of gets caught up in that, oh, i got to go into isolation now. And you're like, no, no, you don't. Kobe scored 10 straight points. Get him the damn ball. But as you just pointed out, on a whole, he is willing. He's adapted. He's made the necessary changes because he's willing to play in the bigger picture. And I'm going to be fully transparent on this as well. And I'll ask you, Lawrence, what is DeMar playing for? A contract. Bingo. He, he's trying to get not, paid. Not, not trying to be negative. Not trying to say, hey, this guy's only doing it for one reason. But that's a big motivating factor. But it's also showing his willingness to sacrifice. And that's the biggest question out of everything. If you truly want to win, what are you willing to sacrifice in order to win? Hey, well. How would you assess improvement in Patrick Williams? Like, what are the what are the things that you're specifically looking for from him? And has he reached some of those goalposts in the last ten games? 
All right, to ask the second part of your question, I think he is now – he's inside the 10-yard line sniffing the end zone, okay? This is what we were hoping for two years ago. It's been a slower process than we had hoped and anticipated, but I think what you're now seeing is a guy that's finally playing with confidence, a guy that's finally starting to figure it out. And not that he didn't figure it out before, but I thought he was just too passive. Now, this is another aspect. You guys talked about how where Vooch is getting the ball and how he's on the move. Patrick Williams is the same way. I can tell you that one of the biggest complaints that we've had, and Patrick quite honestly has had, is somehow he always ended up in the corner and never touched the ball. Mm. And then he felt like he was being isolated. He was being excluded. But then we're all yelling at him, well, run in and get the rebound and play defense and do this and do that. Again, I worked with a gentleman by the name of Kevin Calabro and with the Seattle mm-hmm. Supersonics and the Portland Trailblazers. He's got a saying that I keep talking about, the healing power of the leather. If you know that leather is going to touch your hands, you're going to work a little harder because you know you're going to get rewarded for your effort. We were talking about comps for Kobe White. Like, if he maxes out, who is he? If he can really get the most out of his burgeoning game, who is he? And it's harder to do in this day and age because basketball keeps changing. And if you really want to remind yourself of how quickly basketball is changing, play that comp game sometime. And look at what even basketball reference is having a very difficult time when you start to look at how they use statistical comps and the modeling that they do because this game changes faster than other games may, absent you know baseball and obvious rules changes that they put in there. So who jumps to mind, whether it's former teammates or people you've seen over the years, when you kind of squint at Kobe, who does he look like? Well, I know you brought this up because you and I texted back and forth a little bit because I heard your show the other day, and I texted you later in the evening. He reminds me, and I actually told him this uh, when I saw him the other day, I said, you're starting to remind me a lot of Tony Parker because of the struggles. You know, I, I say to and I say struggles, but when you look at Tony Parker's numbers, you know, he started off pretty su- successful as a rookie. I think, you know, a little less than nine points, but you saw the progression in the scoring, the assist numbers. You know, that's where I, I feel a lot like he's starting to progress. You know, he's got that little floater. Tony Parker was not afraid, you know, to get into the paint. You know, underrated defender, but Greg Popovich identified what he needed Tony to be in order to be the key to that team winning multiple championships with the ball in his hands. Because I remember Tony Parker talking about, you know, I, I thought I had a good game, and then Pop would come up to me and tell me that I sucked tonight. He was being a little dramatic, but he was basically, I wasn't the player that he knew I could be nor needed to be for this team to win championships. But when I got there, we started winning. And if I remember correctly, I'm not saying Kobe's going to get to this point, but there's a lot of similarities. Tony Parker was MVP of the finals one year because of how well he played, but you just talked about a comparison. You also made a comparison that you texted me that I went back and looked at his numbers and I was, I forgot about it, how good Jason Terry was earlier on in his career. Because we, we think of, Jason Terry, the older player, went in a championship with the Mavericks. But when he was younger, you know, he was averaging 18, 19 points a game in this league. As a lead guard, not a pure point. And, you know, and both of those guys are 6'2". You forget that, you know, Kobe's 6'5". And, and I know it's maybe because he releases his shot a little low, a little flat, that you don't you don't realize how big he is. The hair's flopping around and all that. But but he's he's not one of these little dudes. No, and, and he technically is bigger than both those guys as well. Yep. You know, and the fact that when you just talk about 6'5", you know, 6'8", with the hair, Fletch. And then <laughs> he's, he, he's also, he's just thicker. He's bigger. He's stronger than those guys. And I think that that, that suited him quite well. But being that size and still being as quick as he is, is what's really started to pay dividends. I mean, even last night you saw the, the Euro move where he went right, left, back to the right, and, and, you know, nailed the layup. And just 
the biggest thing probably for Kobe for me is his ability to make decisions now at game speed. We saw him make a lot of mistakes, you know, when he first came into the league, just trying to play too fast. And I think it's you hear a lot of players talk about how the game is eventually starts to slow down and they start to see things differently. And I think he's now at that point. Here's another little note that I pulled out of this. Do you know who Tony Parker's most statistically similar player is? Will his, Purdue. N- yeah, his, <laughs> his number one career comp is Maurice Cheeks. Oh, Cheeks. And then that's the other thing. I mean, when that with that team, you know, it was Dr. J and it was Moses Malone. People forget it, or Bobby Jones. Most people forget about Mo Cheeks. Mm-hmm. I mean, great, great player. But again, again, very different NBA yeah, at and, that point. And he's right there. You can ask him questions. Yes, he's coaching him. Yes, he's right there. Right. Um, 